to Mark 11, 23, and then I'm going to pray. Father God, I just thank you for this opportunity that we can gather here today. Lord, I thank you that your Holy Spirit is in us, with us, and amongst us. I thank you, Father God, that where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. I thank you, Father God, for the anointing, the unction of the Holy Spirit. I thank you, Father God, that we didn't come here to play church. I thank you, Father God, that we didn't come here just to pay our dues on Sunday morning, but we came here to worship you, Lord, in spirit and truth. We came here to worship together. We came here to hear the word of God. We came to be in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. We came to experience God in a real tangible way. And so, Lord, I thank you that I can be a vessel that you can use to communicate your word and to be an expression of you in touching people's lives through the spoken word. I thank you, Father God, that your Holy Spirit is here to do what I cannot do. I thank you that your Holy Spirit will speak into the hearts of your people. I thank you that your Holy Spirit will touch their bodies. I thank you that your Holy Spirit will comfort their minds. I thank you, Lord, that your Holy Spirit, the paraclete, the comforter, is here to do what you sent him here to do. And I thank you, Father God, that he has free course to do all that he has been sent to do. And I thank you, Lord, that your people are open hearts and open minds with arms open wide saying, yes, Lord, thy will be done. In Jesus' name, amen. If you can agree with that, say amen. Yes. Hallelujah. See, that's what I'm talking about there, that anointing. Thank you, Lord. But I know it's going to destroy some yoke, amen. Hallelujah. In Mark eleven twenty three, Jesus said, For surely I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, Be removed and be cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. I want you to notice it says, He will have whatever he says. He will have whatever. Here's how you know when faith works. Faith is working when you have what you say. Amen. How many of you know a lot of people talk faith, but they're not getting results of faith? Amen. There's a lot of people, they want to talk about faith, but they want to talk about it in such a way that it doesn't produce any results. How many of you know that's not real faith? At least let me say it this way. It's not faith in action. Because real faith, the God kind of faith, as Jesus said in verse 22 there, always produces results. We see that when Jesus walked by that fig tree and he went to find something to eat and he couldn't find anything. And he said, cursed at your roots. Let no one eat fruit from you hereafter forever. And the next day they walked by and they saw it and they said, Lord, look at the fig tree you've cursed. Right? How many of you know it happened? Well, you know, here's what we do in church if we're not careful. We say, well, you know, that was Jesus. But you have to understand something. Jesus walked this earth as a man. We don't say that to belittle him. We say that because he was our substitute. He came in our place. He came in our place and walked this earth as a man. Yes, he was 100% God in 100% flesh, but he was the son of God who walked this earth. That's why he kept saying, the son of man, the son of man, the son of man. He wanted everybody to understand that what he did was not because he was God in flesh, but what he did was because he was a, a son of man who was empowered by God. His faith works the same way as yours and I's. Jesus didn't have a different kind of faith. God the Father, when he was, as he is on his throne and in the beginning of creation, it's the same faith, true faith, the God kind of faith, the faith that you and I have. It's all the same faith unless we choose a different kind, unless we choose the world system, unless we choose a faith that's not true. But if we're going to operate in faith, if faith is going to be genuine and true, it's the same faith as God. It's the same faith that Jesus used there when he spoke to that fig tree. And see, you and I need to know that if it works for Jesus, it works for us. But we've been religiously brainwashed and sort of scripturally taught. And so many times when we see Jesus do things, when we hear Jesus say things, we are disconnected because we automatically say, well, that was Jesus. I remember growing up in a denominational church and always thinking that whatever Jesus did, it was because he was the son of God and that I could never do those things because I wasn't. He could walk on water, but I never will. 
Really? Listen, if there's ever a need where I, there comes a day where I need to walk on the water, guess who's going to walk on water? That doesn't mean I try to walk out on the pool just because I want to be uh, funny about it. Because then I'm going to get wet. Do you understand what I'm saying? Faith. Remember what faith is? Faith is believing with our heart and saying with our mouth and acting like it's so. Remember this, I've shared this with you several times already, but faith, and I, I want to get this into you because I really believe it will help you. Faith is always as simple as the day you got saved. I'll say it again. Faith is always, and I emphasize the word always, as simple. See, there's our problem right there. When it's not simple, we've complicated it somehow. We've, done, we've taken a wrong turn somehow. Have you ever seen a child use faith and get results? What about us when we got born again? Faith is always as simple as the day we got saved. Matter of fact, the Lord said, said it this way to me. He says, and if it's anything else, you've complicated it. And I believe that. Faith is simple. Romans chapter 10 and verse 8 says, but what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. In your mouth and in your heart. Takes both, folks, not just one or the other. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Notice what happened there. He says, if you confess with your mouth, and you believe in your heart. If you confess with your mouth and you believe in your heart, you will be saved. Isn't that what he said? If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. What if there's no confession? Now, I can't pronounce the word correctly, so I'm not even going to try. But the, the Greek word that this word confession comes from means literally to say the same thing. Say the same. Confession means to say the same thing. Say the same thing what? Say the same thing as God says. And so when we see it here, it says, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. What we're saying? We're saying what God says about us. We're saying what God says about being born again. We're saying what God says about the Holy Spirit coming into us and recreating us and making us children of God. We're saying the same thing. And so what happens is we believe in our heart. Believe what? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Not just Jesus, but the Lord Jesus. Amen. And that God raised him from the dead. Now, the word saved there, and you'll have to bear with me because I love that word. It's from the Greek word sozo. How many of you remember what sozo is? Sozo means saved, healed, delivered, set free, made well, made whole, preserved, protected, and caused to prosper. See, you may not know it. See, I, I gave my life back to the Lord September the 9th, 1979, and on that very day, I was sozoed. I wasn't getting sozoed. I got sozoed. And I've been sozoed ever since. Whatever the day was that you accepted Christ as your Savior, you became sozoed that day. And you've been sozoed ever since. You might roll your eyes and say, oh, really? Yes, Really? Now, whether you are walking in it or not, that may be another issue. Whether you're experiencing the fullness of it or not, that might be another issue. Jesus said, I've come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Doesn't change the truth whether you're walking in it or not. It's still there for you. Abundant life is still there for you whether you're enjoying it or not. But here's what I, I can tell you. Whatever proportion of sozo that we have, whatever, por let, yes, Lord, thank you. Whatever portion of sozo that we are walking in or experiencing is determined by our choices, by our beliefs, by our actions, 
not by God. He already determined it, already did it, already provided it. It's done on his side. See, so many times in Christianity, again, this comes back to that religious brainwashing instead of biblical education, and that is so many times we keep looking for God to do something. Why would we want God to do what he's already done? Well, you know, I've heard this for decades now. Well, you know, we're just waiting on God. Really? You know what? I got news for you. Quit waiting and get busy. Because he's been waiting on you all your life. See, when we don't, yes, Lord, thank you very much. When we don't know the truth, the enemy uses that ignorance to hold us in bondage. You shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free. One of my greatest passions for this church, for each and every one of you, for people as a whole for that matter, is to keep you in the Word of God long enough that it actually registers on your heart and that you really know and believe what God says. Because here's what happens. When we really know and believe, we act like we know and believe. Our life looks like we know and believe. Amen. But here's what happens uh, in the experience uh, that Lisa and I have had in ministry all these years. We find people, they'll come into church. They'll throw their hands up. Whoa, glory. Uh, God brought us here, you know, or God brought you here. Isn't this wonderful? I know that I know and all that, right? And then things, aren't, just things don't go the way they want it to go. And it's like, well, you know, I think I'm going to go somewhere else. Or better yet, they get real spiritual and they say, well, God told me to go elsewhere. Well, wait a minute. Didn't God tell you to come here? And now he told you to go there. Well, which one is it? Did he tell? Well, you know, it was just for a season. Yeah, and that's why you keep flopping around like a dead fish. You're not going to get results that way. If you take a plant, I don't care what it is, and you pull it up out of the ground, and you plant it over here, and then you leave it there for a few weeks or months, and then you pull it back up, and you move it back over here or elsewhere, you know what? Eventually, that thing's going to die. And the enemy knows the same thing's true about you. You and I will dry up spiritually if we keep playing that game. It doesn't mean that we can lose our salvation and go to hell if we were to die. But what it does mean is that our spiritual life is shortened of the blessings and provisions of God because we're too busy playing cruisomatic instead of being true children of God. It's true. Just about the time the breakthrough is ready to come forth, people will all of a sudden find the exit. Most people, if they had experienced anything like our Lord, would have found the exit or the panic button long before they ever stood before Pontius Pilate. They wouldn't even showed up at the upper room for the Last Supper. It's a truth. Because see, by the time when they came to Jesus and said, Lord, where do you want us to prepare that you might observe the Passover? Jesus already knew that was his last one on the earth. He already knew that was the end of the show. And see, most of us, if we knew that, guess what? We'd be finding another place to go. Well, if I just avoid it, it won't happen. I got news for you. When you do that, you just put it right in gear. Mm, man, in the way it's going to happen. You're playing right into the hands of the enemy. Perseverance is so important. Faith is believing with our heart and saying with our mouth and acting like it's so. Another way of saying it is this way. Faith is believing God's word in our heart and acting like it's so by what we say and do. Now, how does this connect with uh, communion? How does this connect with the Lord's table? It connects completely because what that does then is it takes communion, takes the Lord's table from being a ceremony that we have at church to a living experience that we have with our God. Because we're not just simply going through the motions. How many of you know you can do that? You can sit there and you can listen and then we'll hand out the elements and you can take it and you can walk right out the door and nothing has happened. Nothing has changed. In you, 
or on you or anything like that. And that's what that's a tragedy because you know what? The Lord's table has provisions. The Lord's table has power. The Lord's table has great things to offer. But they can only be obtained. They can only be received by faith. They cannot listen, the bread is not something magical. There's nothing magical about the bread or the cup. You know, there's people still looking for what they call the Holy Grail. Like it's going to give them some kind of magical abilities or something. Listen, if it was that magical, don't you think somebody would already have it? Not only that, but if it's that magical, how'd they get lost? All you got to do is use that gray thing that's called the brain. It's like, you know, the robe. How many of you remember the movie? Yeah. The robe. Ooh. Well, it does. The robe means nothing if there's no faith there. See, we're so religious that we're into all these relics. And you know what a relic is, don't you? It's just something dead hanging around too long. It's about faith, people. And if we're going to truly come to the Lord's table, if we're going to truly enjoy communion with our Lord Jesus and enjoy what it actually provides in our life, it has to be by faith. It has to be us believing in our hearts, saying with our mouths and acting like it's so, acting like it's true because it really is. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 23 Paul says this way, he says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you. Pause for a moment. Now see, I can just read right through it, and you can too, and we just, you know, there you go, and you missed the whole thing. For I received of the Lord. I don't know about you, but that means a lot right there. I received it from the Lord. I didn't get it from man. I didn't get it from tradition. I didn't get it from church dogma or anything like that. I got it from the Lord Jesus Christ himself. That's what Paul's saying. You know what that means? That's the same as saying as if the Lord Jesus were standing right here in his glorified body, that we could touch, we could hear his voice and all that, just like he did in the upper room. If that were the case, if Jesus was here personally like that, and he said the same thing to us, Right? Which one's more valid? Both are valid. See, we've got this thing sometimes if we're not careful. Jesus appeared. He said, that makes it so. Well, I got news for you. The inspiration of the Holy Spirit that inspired Paul to write it makes it so. When Paul says, I received of the Lord, it's the same as if the Lord himself had said it to us. It's as if he's standing right here with us right now, speaking these same words to us. And we need to believe that in our heart. We need to act like it's true. And not just simple words in a book. But truly the Lord himself. That the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. How many of you know that what Paul shares with us here is the same thing that's recorded in the three Gospels, the first three Gospels? It's the same thing. You know what this does? That just helps me to know that Paul was hearing from the Lord. Because how many of you know that when someone's talking uh, uh, on behalf of the Lord, when they say God said, how many of you know you ought to be able to back it up with the Word of God? Because how many of you know God will never say what God hasn't said? For I received of the Lord, that the Lord the same night in which he, betrayed, uh, which he was betrayed took bread. Well, we know that's true. And said, take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's consider this for a moment. He said, do this in remembrance of me. Well, we can do that part, Lord. We can remember. He said, the, you know, take and eat. We can do that. But where's faith? Where's faith in 
receiving from the table. Where's faith when we distribute the elements to you today and, and, and you take that wafer and you hold it in your hand? Where's faith? Because, see, you can hold it in your hand and no faith. You can put it in your mouth, no faith. You can swallow it, no faith. And you know what it does then? Nothing. But when you engage it in faith, something happens. Because then you move beyond. It's not transformed, mind you, but you move beyond that because it's representative of his body that was broken. And that's why it talks about that, uh, his body that was broken for you. This automatically pulls us right back into Isaiah 53, 4, and 5. 1 Peter 2, 24, and Matthew 8, 17. All three scriptures telling us the same thing, and that is by his stripes you were healed. The Bible says, in the mouths of two or three, let every word be established. Right there we have it. That's a solid witness. By his stripes ye were healed. I want you to take a moment and let those words really resonate into your heart. Because, see, we can hear it. We can nod our head. Mm hmm that's right. And still not believe it. We need to believe those words. How many of you know that there are some things that we believe real strongly? And then there are some things we just believe lightly. And how many of you know that the stronger the belief, the more it influences what we think and how we act? We call those convictions. You know the word conviction, what it really means? To be convinced. In other words, a conviction, when I, the convictions I have in my life are the things that I'm convinced of. They're based on what I believe at my core. And they are so strong. That I believe these things so strongly that I am convinced of their truth. And because I am so convinced of their truth, it now influences the way I think about those things and the way I act about those things. People believe all kinds of things. But we need to believe what God's Word says. We need to believe the Scriptures. We need to believe God. How many of you know there are people that will say they believe something and then do something completely opposite? Now, I'm not trying to pick on anybody because there's plenty of stuff in the world we could pick at if we want. I just want to use this as an example, all right? On the side, warning the Surgeon General... You know where I'm at, right? Right there on the side of the cigarettes, it tells you smoking these things can cause 